welcome to this next session of day two of Canto 2023. And we've called this, George said, is a, a celebration, clearly a bit of a misnomer, because if we really have to celebrate the, the entire range of his work, that will take up several sessions. What we'll try and do instead is, is focus on his work as, as a painter, the relationship of the visual arts of painting in his, you know, throughout his, his publishing life, uh, particularly his poetry. Um, obviously, George needs no introduction at all, but purely by, by way of protocol and for the uninitiated. And George Serzis's 12th book of poem, Real, which was published in 2004, won him the, the T.S. Eliot Prize and he's been shortlisted for that twice since. His latest collection, which was published in 2021, is called Fresh Out of the Sky, and his memoir, The, the Photographer at 16, which was published in 2019, was awarded the James State Black Prize in 2020. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, a, a co-winner of the International Booker Translators Prize, with his own books in various languages, including Hungarian, Chinese, German, Italian. And he's also written for children, radio, and various composers. And apropos of the fact that uh, we have partner sponsors who are the University of Chicago and the University of Iowa and, and NYU, I think it's worth mentioning that for several years, George was a member of the faculty of the professor at the University of East Anglia. So, uh, George, a very warm welcome to, to Canto, and thank you so much for, for taking time off your schedule. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. George, if I may start by asking a very simple, um, obvious question. I mean, everybody knows about your literary work and the accolades that it has won you, even maybe not read end-to-end -end of all your 12 collections, but more of your Facebook fans, because you put out your your versions and initial versions of, of many of your poems on Facebook would definitely know about your your literary journey and, and all the atlas that's won you over the years. But I think very few people would really know about the fact that in terms of formal education, your, your first degree was that as a visual artist, as a painter, you were trained to be professionally a painter. And I think it'd be great if we start from that point and you talk to us a little bit about that process. What made you join art school and, and you know who are some of your influences back in the day? And then we get to a little bit of your of your earlier original artwork during the 70s. Yeah. Okay. So, right. Well, well when I was at school I was, at school, I was, I was um, doing sciences. sciences. Um, but I had started writing poetry when I was 17. And one year they said to me, because I was deferring one exam, I should go up to the art room. And I hadn't done art for four years. And I went up to the art room, not with normal lessons. The teacher there um, was very good to me and asked me what I'd like to do. So I started painting and drawing. And to my own surprise, I found I was quite good at it. So when I finished school, it was my best examination result. And I had the option of studying psychology at a university or doing art at some art school. Um, I couldn't study English because I didn't do English at the high degree. I didn't do English A-levels. So I went to art school and I went to three different ones. I became a painter. I suppose it would have been 1969 or so. And for some years I was painting. Um, who were influential at the time? Chigal was one of uh, a fairly major influence on me early on. And I liked the surrealists generally, although I also like Cezanne. I was not painting anything like Cezanne, but I found the formalism of Cezanne um, not just impressive, but very moving. The Chagall side of it was simply a kind of freedom. You could create a color field, lay down a color, you could put what you liked there, and it was like a world of which you were in control, um, and you could put in whatever elements you liked. 
So I produced a number of quite big paintings, about four foot by four foot paintings. Um, and I also, towards the end of my course, I started working with etching, which is um, um, a print process. So that's how that happened. And it was a good art school career. I, ha I had an exhibition. I got a very good pass. Um, I got prizes of one or two um, sorts. Um, and then I left, and then I had to find work. So that's how I got to that point. What medium were you using when you were in school and when you were in, in art, art school later on, right? Uh, you talked about the etchings, but I think that the etchings came much later. What mediums were you usually using uh, earlier? Well, when I, was, I knew nothing about technique when I was in school, but funnily enough, I could get a likeness. So I was drawing things in pencil, in charcoal, when I was painting, I was painting then in water-based paints in, um, oh, just, just very basic powder colors, which were then mixed with water, which were mixed with various media. Um, but when I went to art school, I started working with oils and usually working on board, on hard board, so not on canvas. I would prepare the board, um, sometimes just as simple as with white emulsion and then would begin painting in oils and then return to it and change things. Um, so those are my main media. Um, and right through art schools, yes, that's essentially what I was doing. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about, about this, you know, particularly in relation to what you talked uh, earlier around the, the color feed? Yes. And, um, or, or maybe even Eve Klein. Um, here you've got uh, Red, and I was trying to fathom whether that spoke to you in its own way because there's another one which we'll talk about later. Uh, I think it's called Gold Gota, which yes. surprisingly is also predominantly red. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yes, yes I, I can talk about that. I mean, uh, those are a coincidence because after the red one, that one which is what it shows is a snowman with a blue hat and a scarf and a football pitch in the middle of it. Um, and around the bottom of the snowman are a lot of um, houses, just normal houses. Um, the whole thing is then put into a circle, like a rosette, and behind the rosette is a red and yellow um, emblem, which is very much like the kind of klaxon you might have um, at a match. There's a, a, a um, lamppost above it, which is shining down. And the way I began these paintings, and the next one had a lot of green, the next one had a lot of blue, I gave myself a color field and then I worked into the color field. So then the, having put down the basic reds, moved it around so that the textures felt okay, um, I would begin to draw with a brush. And it might begin with something as simple as a blue line surround, surrounding the circle. Um, I would think, okay, well, what am I painting about here? And I think I was painting about memories um, of going home after a football match in London um, under lamplight in the cold with a scarf. But I was also, um, I'd fallen in love at that time. Um, and uh, you'll see a naked couple embracing there as well. That wasn't at the same time as a football matches, but you know, time was not important. I just kept adding elements. Basically what I was doing is I was forgetting almost deliberately forgetting the kind of um, uh, disciplines of drawing. I could draw, and I carried on drawing. Um, and I just wanted to see what would happen if one began from something as basic as a color. And I quite like strong colors. Not many people were using them. Um, and I like to see what would happen when you put a good strong, not quite a primary red, along with a reasonably primary green, and you created a it's, you create a space within which you can add um, whatever you like. So it is a kind of freedom. This would go back to about 1970. This painting, uh, George, and, and I could be wrong here completely. Um, you obviously talked about the influence of Schoel around this time, and not at all in terms of the form or, or the figure that's being represented but just the, the pure contrast, uh, you know, the, the blue against the surrounding red and, and again, the, the bottle of green against 
the red, just to contrast, if I were to you know, take my specs off and, and see it completely in abstraction, uh, it was not a very, it, it, to me, one to a million miles away from some of the earlier paintings of Emil Nolder, for, for instance, some of the other German um, abstract expressionists, Max, Max Beckmann. Um, does, does, does that resonate with you at all? Yes, it does, I think. Nolder, um, Painters like Georges Rouault um, were important to me. Um, all those people who used paint in an emotional sort of way um, for the sensation that it gave one of a kind of a, an emotional ambience, if you like. I loved the expressionists as well. I, I, I liked Mark Serens. Um, I like um, Miro. I liked all of these people. But I suppose I mentioned Chagall first. Not so much because I was thinking of him directly when I was painting these, but when I looked back, I thought, yes, I can see what there is. Both Chagall and my paintings of this period were celebratory. They were celebratory of things um, that I loved and I looked forward to. Um, I liked walking home in the late autumn. I liked walking um, past snowmen. I liked going to football matches and then walking past streets at night and you can see the sky in the middle and, and the circle below. So all these things were, these were discoveries to me. And this is quite a big painting, about four foot by four foot. And basically all my paintings of the early period at art school were on the same format and worked in the same way, although they looked different. Um, so there would be a basic color, then there would be an attempt with line and see what the line was doing. Then I would add one um, one element after another. There were no sketchbooks for these. These are all um, improvisations on a large scale. Um, that's that's fascinating, George. And I was just just wondering, um, did you ever do versions around the the same theme, around the same subject? And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you where I'm going with this. If you if you remove the the figure, the central figure, and if you were to no, let's let's keep the picture back again. Yeah. And if you were to to bring the circle up into the center, right? Just, just bear with me for a minute. And then you have the embracing couple. And if you have to have, if you were to then introduce variations of that across the the entire circle. That would make it almost uh, a Matisse, wouldn't it, in a way? Well, Matisse, again, I, I loved Matisse too, but I wasn't going to paint quite like Matisse, not at this stage. I mean, later on, as I developed, um, then, well, of course, the influences grew and influences changed. Um, but yes, there's a color. There's a Matisse's Red Studio, for example. Um, <laughs> which um, obviously bears a certain resemblance to this. Um, I like these early paintings. I used to have a lot of paintings, I've, but I stopped painting in about the middle of the 1980s um, for various reasons I can mention if you like. But um, in a way, there was a freshness about these early works, which, which, I, which I still like. I mean, the painting that we are looking at now is hanging on a wall just to my left behind me. Um, I have kept very much of my artwork. I have kept the etchings, I've kept those little drawings, and I kept a few small paintings. But this was a basis, as I said, the center of it was <coughs> the establishing of an ambience of color. And then see what happened when you began to draw into that color. I never liked the pure white surface. I never liked the kind of the idea of having layer upon layer upon layer. I wanted the immediacy and the freshness. Um, what does red do? Um, how much space does it create? Um, what does it make space for? Right. Um, and I think just just looking at the time, uh, we might move on not to to Golgotha, but further down the line to one of your etchings. Uh, yep. I think it's called three three muses, the three graces. Yes, yes, the three, the three graces. Yep. This is later. This is um, 80s, 70s, 80s. Um, 
And like the other things, I'd have, I'd have a basic idea that I would draw three women dancing. And of course, three men dancing together is modeled upon the idea of the graces. They are, they're in a kind of circle dance. And at the bottom left-hand corner, you see uh, a monkey. And I think it's probably a mandrel, as I remember. Um, and etchings are a very different process. I and mean, you can draw with immediacy in the way as I could with paint. Um, but etchings build because they depend, as some people might know, upon making marks on a metal plate, um, which is covered in wax. And then you put it in the acid and that makes a mark and then you can take a print of it and put it back in. So it's a much more cumulative process. But this was a kind of field in which my imagination um, was happiest. And this field, actually, the field of etchings, lay a lot closer to my sense of what my poetry was and what it was broadly starting. I mean, interestingly, uh, you, you seem to be going from color fields, pure color fields, to the negation of colors, which is here in etching, and then returning to, to colors uh, in, your, in your writing, particularly when you're talking about you, you know, your, your poems like the blue shirt or, or the poem that's entitled Colors, which we should come to. And I was wondering whether at this point of time you were just involved or invested in just just this stark modeling of forms that you know that there's something about this I can't quite place my finger on it, which to me is is reminiscent perhaps of Kata Korowitz's uh, some of her etchings, some of her gra graphics and visual work. But in any case, it, it suggests to me a negation or a shift away from color to, to monochrome, to, to absolute sort of starkness of black and white. Well, there's a difference. When I was at art school, when I was art school I, there was an enormous hangar of a studio, and I could work in a space that was big enough to accommodate big pictures. I carried on doing that after I left my main course um, for a while. And then I. I should say I'm married to an artist. My wife, Clarissa, is an artist and a far better artist than I am, I think. But um, so she was working in one part of the house. I was working in another part of the house. And while I was doing the black and white things, these etchings, um, I was working on small boards. So I would do small colored paintings. Returning to the colors as to how they make their way into the poetry. I'll tell you that there's a very brief little story behind that. Um, we were both going to an artist shop, a, a colour merchant called Cornelison's in London. And Clarissa was buying something, I can't remember what. But on the shelf of the shop were these jars, these beautiful glass jars of pigments, pure pigments. And I was looking particularly at one of them. And, I, and, I was, and as I was looking at it, I kept thinking that color is speaking to me in some way. It wants to say something. Um, and that was immediately for like the beginning of an idea of working a poem out of that color. So I started that. I wrote a sonnet, in fact. It wasn't very good. But then the idea of looking at other colors and seeing what was implicit in them um, led to a great many other um, poems about colors. I mean, probably over the various books, 40, 50, in terms of titles and even more of sonnets, because some of the sonnets stretch to 10 sonnets, 12 sonnets, and so forth. And I became very entranced with this over several years. As I said, these, these sonnets lasted over several years. And in fact, this coming Monday, I'm speaking to a conference of painters, and I'm speaking uh, even now about the contra uh, the connection between um, the sensation of color and the sensation of language and how color can produce, if you like, um, works in language. Right. Um, and, and just in that context, uh, if you've got it at hand, would you like to, to talk about and but first read out the, the poem entitled Colors, where you have this entire collection, you, you build up this palette of yep. imaginary invented colors and many colors which, which actually exist. But. Of course. What happened when I was writing that long series of color poems is um, I began to start buying 
um, charts of colors available, commercial colors, and I noticed their names. And I began, and I began to think that the names of colors um, but they're clearly suggestive, and that's why commercial operations call their colors by charming names. So I thought I would put together, a, or, um, in the old way that I was doing the normal color poems, um, but in which there would be real colors, and there'd be colors that I'd simply invent, whose capacity to suggest uh, would remain slightly mysterious. So is, these are two sonnets. The first sonnet simply contains names of colors invented. Um, then a the second sonnet is a kind of um, reflection on what's going on. Here. Colors. Burleywood, Chartreuse, Gainsborough, Ghost White, Greenberg, Maroon, Orchid, Mocassin, Peru, Demosthenes, Snow, Papaya Whip, Popper, Peach Puff, Hot Pink, Hot Hot, Dark Red, Dark Grey, Dodger Blue, Drudgery, Derrida, Fuchsia, Fondal, Fricassee, Firebrick, Fenfall, Coral, Corn Silk, Crimson, Coleridge, Coolidge, Honeydew, Hellbore, Hartshorn, Honegger, Jet, Jellyby, Lavender Blush, Lascar, Light Cyan, Light Light, Grey, Grey Green, Garrulous, Golightly, Garrick, Indignant, Insolence, Irked, Ivory, Ilk, Jeremiah, Asclepius, Goldenrod, Arivist, Lock, Cyan, Chocolate, Cadet Blue, Camisole, Fallen Grey, Flecked, Was Blue, Amaretto, Shrubbery, Yearning, Absinthe, Abstinence, grey holes in green. Would you like me to read the second sonnet? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Second sonnet. Had these been voices, the wind might have sung them through a hedge or an empty head. It was winter, then spring, then summer, then autumn, thunder and lightning, the beating of a red drum. Had it been blue guitar, or purple rose, or black Sunday? Had it been brown study, devil's dyke, or dun, as in dunk? Had it been grey fry, or red eye, or permanganate, or potassium? Had their names been their being? Had the retina been in service? Had the hot stores burned away with the seasons? Had it been anything but dinner in the provinces? Had the spectrum not gone awry? Had it ever fallen out like this, with a light lost in the jungle of the voice, with its brilliance and dust? That is, that is really beautiful. Joy, I'm going to take you back to the first sonnet, and uh, my clear favourite of all those invented colours is, is clearly Elida. <laughs> But uh, here's, here's the thing, it's, it's not just individual colours, there, there, are, there are those, just by pronouncing the word Gainsborough, you evoke a palette, a particular palette, especially the later Gainsborough, where he's, he's trying to be his own Titian or his own Rembrandt, and just, you know, the, the primary colours, red, white and black, with all his portraits, uh, and then you have Maroon, and then you have the reader. Uh, was that a conscious choice, or were you... Were you guided by the music of the names, or were you saying, look, I'm, I'm going to have two kinds, multiple layers of games going on here. So one is a palette juxtaposed against primary colours and also the music of the, the names. Well, the music was very important, of course. It has to be good to say. But then there are various, there's some real colours. I think Gainsborough is probably a real colour. Chartreuse is a real colour. Ghost White might be, but Greenberg isn't. Clement Greenberg was an art critic of the 1960s. Maroon and Orchid may be real. Mocassin isn't. Demosthenes, well, we know who that is. Then there is Popper, Karl Popper. Um, then there is Derrida, as you mentioned. Um, and there is Coleridge. So these are names that come to me and that seem to me to 
find a kind of home of suggestion within this list, um, which is a kind of slightly intoxicating set, not only of sounds, and there's Honegger, the composer, is in there. Um, there's Garrick, the actor, Asclepius, and Glock, the composer. These are just gorgeous sound in some ways, um, but they open up the nonsense into realms that are, well, they're suggestive and, and, and um, amusing, um, but also through being amusing, um, to me, sort of wonderful, because they they are they open to a kind of synesthetic body of experiences. That's that's great because you you sort of preempted my next question, which was going to be about synesthesia. And if we go back a hundred years, for example, to to the years of the Weimar Republic and, and, and the Bauhaus, right? And and we have contemporaries like. Kandinsky on the one hand, and and Paul Clay, who are, who are contemporaries and indeed friends, uh, and both of them really worked in the sphere of synesthesia, but they came at it, they approached it from completely different angles, didn't they? I mean, for 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 someone like Kandinsky, uh, not very much unlike uh, a Degas, where he would emote the colours of, of the ballet dancers and therefore emote the the, the verve of the performance. Kandinsky would also, in this very, very evocative, powerful, expressionist juxtaposition of colors, he would emote colors as opposed to uh, a mathematically structured sequence of notes. Whereas someone like Paul Clay would take a piece of music by Bach, literally break it down bar by bar, and then note by note, he would transcribe the note, and then for each note, he would have an equivalence. He would have a mapping, which is a combination of A color and A form, right? Uh, a, a basic geometric shape. And, and I was wondering, between these two sort of, you know, extremes of the spectrum, when you talk about synesthesia, how do you view it? How does it, how does it move you? Well, I think synesthesia is a natural condition for most artists, and certainly for poets who don't deal in the material. They don't deal with, with hard materials, they deal with language. The synesthesia is there in the evocation of other experiences through other senses, um, in almost any level of language. But in poetry, these things become far more important they become they become part of the, your basic um, experience of working so what a poet to me somebody who a poet is somebody who listens very very hard um, and to hear things within what he or she is listening to um, language is an extraordinary palette which will conjure you anything from flavor to smell to touch through, through all of the senses. Um, I think in some cases, um, such as um, poems about paintings or poems about music, and I've been involved in that as well. I'm currently working with a kind of music collaborative project. Um, that one thing makes you think of another. And when you think of it, you not only think of it, uh, you experience it. And I think I think that's, in a way, it's essential to the nature of poetry, that that should be the case. Go back to, to colors and, and, and color fields. Uh, you have a poem called Blue Shirt, which I'm particularly fond of. And if you have it at hand, I think it'd be great if you talk a little bit about how it came into being, how it shaped itself, and then maybe read about for us. Of course. Well, I can tell you exactly how that started. I was on a train. Um, it was quite a busy train. And from where I was sitting, um, across the aisle, but further down, um, with her back to me, there was a woman in this blue shirt, um, which, and she was working at her computer. <coughs> I never did see her face. I only saw her shoulder with the blue shirt. 
which is a strong, rather beautiful blue. And it echoed the color of the sky at the time. It was dark, it was dusk. So it was a dark sort of blue. And I thought, well, why am I, why after all am I noticing this shirt? It wasn't her so much as a person, as a woman or anything else, but there was somebody who was working away with this sex, with this um, very powerful um, and very evocative color on her, which seemed to be part of a schema within which the very sky itself was taking part. Um, so I was, and it made me think of the soul, of the idea of the soul and how when you are, the soul as it is associated with color, as it is associated with movement, could the soul be colored? Um, could the soul have a, could it have a, a, a sensory um, presence? And then the poem started from the very first line. Um, and so, there are, you know, one doesn't uh, plan, a, or at least a, I'm not a systematic creature. I couldn't have done the, the clay squares that you were talking about. I'm, I'm a kind of instinctive, intuitive sort of person, really. And I suspect a great many words are. Um, and you don't know where you start. You start with one thought and one sensation. And that begins to then move you on through the very words that you're using. The language itself shifts. And you listen to a language as you're writing, it's a, as it comes out, and you wonder where that will go. So that's how that goes. So the regularity here is one of the verses of the same line. Um, I don't think I need to say anything more about it. So it's a speculation as to whether a blue shirt can be a, itself a soul. Shall I read it? Yes, please. Okay. A blue shirt. There are moments that soul exists as intensely as the blue of a shirt or the landscape sliding by a train window, not as an item of belief, but as a figure it might be possible to know, to greet, embrace, to violate, or hurt in a space between love and grief, fine as a set of delicate wrists. And the notion that wrists might be cut occurs to you as a thought it is natural to think, as natural as a pen sliding across a page, or the busy look of, say, a woman as she taps at a keyboard, of no particular age, but still in a position to dream or sink into the arms of someone in an unframed future that is undoubtedly hers. Just so, Beethoven picks at the same scabs time and again, as his soul were an itch as real as a skin in which he squirms, in a time like the landscape that's gone in the dark as the train moves, whose terms are echo and echo, as if soul were a rich relative you might touch for cash, or a loan to tidy over a few unpaid tabs. And it may be the soul is coloured blue, like that shirt, which is as real as anything that music might dream of, or the woman typing might imagine as her fingers move over the keys till her work is done, or the vanished landscape that is about to sing in the dark while a soul lingers at the window seeking a frame to look through. We could, we could really easy keep on listening to you for hours uh, but just looking at the time there is another aspect that i wanted to to touch upon which is slightly more formal and i'm, and I'm tempted to to use the word commissioned where uh, you you have turned your focus or been requested to on specific works of art and and the one that i'm that, that readily comes to mind uh, and, and correct me if i'm wrong i think this was a commission from the, the national gallery uh, in, in in London, and yes. they have uh, quite a few Titians, uh, including that the famous portrait by a Titian, um, which in the just in the next hall, which is room number twenty three, and Rembrandt does his own version uh, as, as as a self portrait, if I remember correctly, uh, and 
I was I was wondering if you want to talk a little bit about that collaborative work with, with the National Gallery and then read out the, the, the poem that was inspired by Titian. I love commissions. I love people asking me to do things and then even saying roughly what it is they'd like me to do. They don't tell me how to do it, which is good, but um, it solves an enormous problem as to what you're going to write about. Because once you begin to focus on the object that is being put in front of you, or the idea put in front of you, things begin to blossom and I'm curious to see where they will go. I mean, almost everything is underlined by curiosity. So a number of different poets were asked to produce poems um, based on a Titian exhibition. That um, picture that I chose, which was available for choosing, was the painting of Actaeon, you know, the myth in which um, he's out hunting. And as he's hunting um, with his dogs, he comes across a stream. And then on the other side, he sees the naked goddess Diana um, bathing with her fellow maids. And when she notices that she's being observed, um, she makes the dogs turn on him. And the dogs tear him to pieces. He turns into deer, basically. And um, she turns him into a deer and the dogs tear him to pieces. So there's a very interesting um, question here about um, chance, um, passion, guilt, um, propriety, all of these things. And um, to me, it associated itself with a line from Don, oh, my America, my newfound land, where the America is the body of the woman um, he's currently in love with, if there is indeed a real woman. We don't actually know that. Um, so the whole idea begins with, oh, my America. And then you discover this scene. Um, in the painting, there seems to be a kind of curtain, a very flimsy kind of curtain as on a washing line, which Actium pushes aside. Um, so the question is, when you look at something, is your eye stealing something? Is it borrowing? Is it taking something without permission? Um, how does the body betray itself? And so on. And how do we even begin to approach the notion of desire? So this is the poem, it's called Actio, and it begins with a Don quote. Oh, my America, discovered by slim chance, behind, as it seemed, a washing line I shoved aside without thinking. Does desire have thoughts or define its object, consuming all in a glance? You, with your several flesh, sinking upon itself in attitudes of hurt, while the dogs at my heels growl at the strange red shirt under a horned moon. You, drinking night water, tell me what the eye steals or borrows. What can't we let go without process? My own body turns against me as I sense it grow contrary. Whatever night reveals is dangerously toothed. And so the body burns as if torn by sheer profusion of skin and crime. It wears its ragged dress like something it was found comfort in, the kind of comfort even a dog learns by scent. So flesh falls away, ever less human, like desire itself, though pain still registers in the terrible talent the mind seems so reluctant to retain. Oh, my America, my nakedness. Um, George, we are coming towards the end of our allotted time, and uh, what I'll do at this stage is is just open it up for questions uh, before we conclude. And one with John, do you, do you have? I suppose I was curious when you were talking about the the painting in the first place to think about the time at which that was made, and uh, is this not? It's on, it's on. It's on, okay. I can um, hear you. 
and the fact that you didn't cite any of the American abstract expressionists or other um, color artists. So I could see, for example, um, some kind of kinship with Rothko in the relationship between the green and the red, or indeed with somebody like Hans Hoffman, who approached this in a much less emotional way. And I guess that the, the answer to that is something to do with emotion and um, the way in which you encode emotion in your color use, um, as opposed to the coolness of somebody like Hoffman. At the time I was painting, red painting, for example, um, the abstract expression is didn't mean enough to me. Um, as you can probably tell from the texture of the painting, and they're, they're, they're very tactile sort of things. They are gestural paintings as well as, if you like, color fields. Um, and I liked, I liked the sense of grasp. I liked the sense of um, being able to touch something. Um, I was also very much in love at the time, so I wasn't thinking in terms of um, I, I wasn't thinking <clears throat> in abstract terms. I think about them far more now. So, for example, the name of Clement Greenberg works its way into the poem about Khalif. Um, um, because all these things, you're, well, you know yourself, I mean, you're trying to square a whole lot of things. And you think, well, how does one move from here to somewhere else interesting yet relevant so it isn't actually arbitrary? Well, as I said, I'm not schematic. I, I don't really have a, I don't really have a very, very systematic mind. Um, I work my way through. I touch this. Having touched that, what do I touch next? But so I wasn't thinking about the abstract about the, the field of pure abstraction, or uh, or about any of the Americans at that time. It occurs to me that one quality that the painting and the poems you read share is that of saturation. Would you like to go with that at all? Yeah, I like saturation. I don't mind saturation. Um, I mean, when we moved into this house, this house is full of colours. You can't see it from where I am now. But, you know, we've got a blue room, we've, we've got a sort of greenish room, etc. Um, and they're quite dense colours. They work for me. Um, um, I'd imagine whoever buys a house is going to paint it all white or some other color, and you get rid of it. You paint the murals on the walls. Um, so, yes, saturation, enough or too much. Who said that? It's, it's bad. It's Blake said it actually, enough or too much. Um, I, I suppose I'm drawn to this like, like, like certain sort of birds, I don't just certain sort of seed. I don't apologize for it, it's just the way it is. No, no, it's a, I'm not sure that there's such a thing as too much when it's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the kind of semantic load of poetry. Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, is this, well, you yourself know this. I mean, I know your poetry, don't I? I think I do. Yes. Tell me your name. Um, my name, I'm Joe Wilkinson. Yeah. So, uh, right. Okay. I may be wrong. Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, George. Um, it's this was really, really wonderful. Um, and I was I was wrapping my brains having gone through just about every uh, keynote speech and, and lecture and an interview and, and reading that's available online, particularly on YouTube, and was trying very hard to do something. A little bit different, say, say. Hopefully, this was this was good fun for you. Thank you, thank you so very much, uh, George. Wonderful talking to you. It's my great honor and privilege. Uh, can we have a round of applause? Please. Please. Thank you again. Thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be part of the festival.